The Cossacks by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Louise and Elmer Maud Chapter 2 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. At the age of eighteen he was free, as only rich young Russians in the forties who had lost their parents at an early age could be. Neither physical nor moral fetters of any kind existed for him. He could do as he liked, lacking nothing and bound by nothing. Neither relatives, nor fatherland, nor religion, nor wants existed for him. He believed in nothing, and admitted nothing. But although he believed in nothing, he was not a morose or blasé young man, nor self-opinionated, but on the contrary, continually let himself be carried away. He had come to the conclusion that there is no such thing as love, yet his heart always overflowed in the presence of any young and attractive woman. He had long been aware that honours and position were nonsense. Yet involuntarily he felt pleased when at a ball Prince Sergius came up and spoke to him affably. But he yielded to his impulses, only in so far as they did not limit his freedom. As soon as he had yielded to any influence and become conscious of its leading on to labour and struggle, he instinctively hastened to free himself from the feeling or activity into which he was being drawn and to regain his freedom. In this way he experimented with society life, the civil service, farming, music, to which at one time he intended to devote his life, and even with the love of women in which he did not believe. He meditated on the use to which he should devote that power of youth which is granted to man only once in a lifetime, that force which gives a man the power of making himself, or even, as it seemed to him, of making the universe, into anything he wishes. Should it be to art? to science, to love of woman, or to practical activities. It is true that some people are devoid of this impulse, and on entering life at one place, their necks under the first yoke that offers itself and honestly labour under it for the rest of their lives. But Olenin was too strongly conscious of the presence of that all-powerful god of youth, of that capacity to be entirely transformed into an aspiration or idea, the capacity to wish and to do, to throw oneself headlong into a bottomless abyss, without knowing why or wherefore. He bore this consciousness within himself, was proud of it, and, without knowing it, was happy in that consciousness. Up to that time he had loved only himself, and could not help loving himself, for he expected nothing but good of himself, and had not yet had time to be disillusioned. On leaving Moscow he was in that happy state of mind in which a young man, conscious of past mistakes, suddenly says to himself, that was not the real thing. All that had gone before was accidental and unimportant. Till then he had not really tried to live, but now with his departure from Moscow, a new life was beginning, a life in which there would be no mistakes, no remorse, and certainly nothing but happiness. 